Thank you for tuning in to Roll Call. The movie you selected is Lila and Eve. Hey everyone, welcome to Roll Call, the show where two childless millennials gush over movies and follow an actor's journey from their early years through their blockbuster hits. Because let's face it, we miss blockbuster. Yes, and like our leading ladies in today's movie, Blockbuster was a real ride or die back in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Never left our sides. Never. Except one day it did, <laughs> and it was really sad. Hi, I'm Bria, and I'm not sure whether I preferred Ben Affleck taking a drag or Jennifer Lopez taking a little puff puff pass in, well, not the marijuana, but <laughs> a little cigarette puff in this movie <laughs> and i'm simone and bria it's time to get our tina on <laughs> that okay i'm impressed that was a good line <laughs> thank you thank you all right so in today's episode we'll chat about jennifer lopez in the 2015 crime drama lila and eve co-starring the amazing viola davis so let's take a trip back to 2015 again all right so i had deja vu because we did the boy next door which was mm -hmm. in 2015 mm -hmm. and i was like oh shit i gotta find shit i didn't talk about <laughs> <So> <laughs> it's a challenge and it's going to be a challenge in the future we'll probably just repeat a bunch of stuff and that's probably. how pop culture works <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so 2015 Pixar emotionally fucks us up Not again. <laughs> you weren't ready for that hot take? <laughs> uh, bitch, fuck me up. <laughs> what they Pixar, do? Pixar emotionally fucks us up yet again with the animated movie Inside Out. And now <gasps> let's pour one out for Bing Bong. Oh, I love my Bing Bong. Oh my God. You have. <laughs> okay. I have to remember, I need to write a note to put this video like on social media. <laughs> Cause how, how perfect is that? He actually smells like cotton candy right in the belly. And I am, yes, me and Bria are very much Disney adults. We're not ashamed of it. And when these Bing Bong plushies came out, I think in 2015, it was like, they were flying off the shelves and they were only sold at like a particular part of the park in Pixar Pier and Disney's California Adventure. And um, it was like, I remember it was like the end of the day and there was like one more bing bong on the shelf. And I looked at it and this other woman looked at it and she looked at me and she just like snatched it. Oh, <laughs> and damn. I've, I've okay, never... Karen. <laughs> yeah, I've never experienced that before. So I just was really patient and really nice. And I asked if they were going to have any back out by the end of the day. And they said no. So I did what any good person would do, which is make my friends buy one for me the next time they went. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how the Disney finesse works. Mm -hmm. um, and we're childless millennials. So we'll probably never feel the thrill that you know, parents across the world felt when things like Cabbage Patch dolls and Furbies were all the rage and they were fighting and Toys R Us. So, Ugh, yeah, maybe maybe as aunties, we'll like, we'll, like for <laughs> wees, we'll be like, I could get this for little Elliot and MJ. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Pixar emotionally mm -hmm. fucks us up. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, man, where was I? Kendrick Lamar kind of emotionally fucked me up a little bit with this album, but mm -hmm. in a very, very good way. Um, the album To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar is released. Kendrick Lamar wins a Nobel Prize for this. Huh. I think. I might be lying. <laughs> um, another kind of controversial, or not another, but controversial news, Rachel Dolezal, um, who mm -hmm. became known for... Uh, pretending she was black so her black card definitely got revoked ripped to shreds 
can't ever piece that thing back together. <laughs> oh, okay. I had to look up a picture of her because I wanted to double check and make sure that I was remembering this correctly. That was fucked up. This yes. straight up white woman pretending that she was black. God. Yeah, and I think she worked for like the NAACP or something. Yeah, she did. Yeah, just black fishing at its finest. <laughs> and now it's just it's just everywhere. Uh, also in 2015, we were whipping and we were naying oh. to the hottest songs on the block. <laughs> now watch me whip. Now watch me nay nay. Now watch me whip whip. Watch me nay nay. Watch um, it, watch it. Oh, okay. I remember so, that year that costume was popular for Halloween. It was like a horse mask and like whipped cream. And it was like, watch me whip and nay nay. It was really I never, never heard of that. Wow. Well, expect only but the best in middle school, Bria, because that's what we get. <laughs> Were black kids doing that or was that? No. Okay. <laughs> Those are straight white kids too. My that. alarm went off. That, <laughs> That, like black people have that's like that's some white people shit like <laughs> um so songs we were probably whipping and naying to were like trap queen by young d um 679 by fetty wop who yes 2015 was kind of the year that trap like blew up yeah bitch better have my money by rihanna Show me what you owe me. You know, oh my god, Classic Man by Jadina. Oh, oh, I'm a classic man. So good. Um, but yeah, so 2015, not not too shabby. I feel like anything pre-2020 at this point is just like, take me back. I don't care. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yes, totally. Maybe not the Trump years, but. No, like pre-2016. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, now I lost my notes. Okay, back, back to where we are. My last pop culture piece is Taraji P. Henson, actress extraordinaire, finally gets the flowers she deserves with the role of Cookie Lion on Empire. My girl was everywhere once Empire premiered, and she's been doing big things ever since. I, of course, knew her from her role in Baby Boy, um, which is a black classic always on BET um but yeah so that's what I'm gonna wrap up with and movies of 2015 um so fun fact the boy next door and mm-hmm. this movie came out the same month in 2015 they did but this movie is sort of an indie movie and it was yeah. premiered at the Sundance Film Festival which is something i still want to go back to Mm -hmm. so instead of movies that were in the theater i'm going to do movies that were at sundance that were recommended Ooh! so vulture has a list oh excellent oh this is a fun list all right let's go (laughs) vulture has a list of the 18 best films from sundance in 2015 we have some gems in here like a movie with margot robbie um chris pine and chidwell oh my god his last name i'm sorry man (laughs) i i don't even see it in front of me but anyways some bomb ass movies at sundance so Mm -hmm. the best of enemies okay uh cartel land which i can only imagine it's probably interesting yeah um the d train okay jack black's in that and james marsden Mm mm-hmm Diary of a Teenage Girl, which has Kristen Wiig in it and El- Alexander Skarsgård. Okay. Um, Dope, which I've seen, which was, um, I think Pharrell produced the movie or I'm, he was involved somehow, but um, pretty cool, fun movie, like 90s kids. Mm-hmm. Um, James White, um, Cynthia Nixon from Sex and the City is in this. Um, the Last Days in the Desert, which is about Jesus in the <laughs> desert with Ewan McGregor. <laughs> is you and Jesus? Uh, yes, Ewan McGregor plays Jesus and the wow. devil. What? That's got to be such like 
big shoes to fill. <laughs> like, you know, our our guy from Angel Eyes played Jesus in Passion of the Christ. Like, you got to think once you get the role, that's like the weight. And this is coming even from a Jewish person. I just feel like any biblical character you play has to... What a significance. Can you imagine, like, if, if all the people who play Jesus, like, died and they go to heaven and they're in. And, <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus is there, like, not cool. <laughs> you got it all wrong. <laughs> or, like, what if there's, like, one day he's like, oh, my God, like, I loved your performance. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, oh okay. You know, I tried to pull some strings at the Oscars, but, you know, I can only do so much. <laughs> oh, my God. And we're going to hell. <laughs> um, there's a documentary about uh, Marlon Brando, which he is narrating, oh. even though he had passed away more than a hmm. decade ago. But it's called Listen to Me, Marlon. So I'm sure that's interesting. Um, me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. That's my kind of movie title. I probably would have wanted to see that um connie britton's in here mm -hmm. um um z for zachariah is the movie that i was talking about that has chitwatil is you mm. is your <laughs> i'm so sorry um i'm gonna listen to somebody pronounce that right so i can say it right one day um chris pine and um, margot robbie oh what was the name of it z is for zachariah z for zachariah yeah oh okay so this one is like a post-apocalyptic future where Marjorie Robbie lives on a farm and she thinks she's the last person on earth. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't need to watch that anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have. So on that note, please tell us what this movie made or how it was distributed, how people saw it outside of Sundance. Yes, I sure can do that. And I know I'm glad I'm actually really glad you did the Sundance list because shit, I maybe heard of like two of those out of yeah. that list. And I know that that's like sometimes a sad reality that like films never make it past that. Yeah. Um. So thank you for like schooling me. That sounds like some really good like movies came out. And I, I kind of want to check it out. <laughs> but it makes sense that this movie just never really made it past fruition. So it was re it premiered January 30th in the 2015 Sundance, but then it was released very, very limitedly on July 17th, 2015. Um, and then consequently was then released uh, video to video on demand. Mm. Um, and so the total grossing of this movie might surprise you if you haven't seen it already, but I think just because of the fact that it may be premiered in one or two small independent movie theaters, the box office numbers for this are interesting. So the budget of this movie was $4.9 million. We'll call that a, an even cool five. <laughs> <laughs> um, an opening weekend only grossed $21 thousand eight hundred dollars hmm. and then um after its total gross with it, uh, limited release through small independent theaters its total gross was a hundred and eighty thousand dollars estimate now i wasn't able to find the numbers on how many people might have rented it or downloaded it through the video on demand system but I mean, to not even break a mill just seems, or even like two hundred thousand dollars seems a little shocking to me. Yeah, I mean, it does. But at the same time, we kind of saw this with an unfinished life in mm -hmm. um, Border Town and uh, El Cantante. And sometimes these are J Lo doesn't have a lot of these, but sometimes you know you have these indie films that are really interesting and break the mold of typical big budget movies and mm -hmm. you do them but they don't do so well or they don't get to reach the audience as much as you'd like yeah um at this point i think viola davis is taking off as a star in her own right in mm -hmm. 2015 you know she's got some name recognition but maybe not the same necessarily commercially as j-lo mm. so 
even though you have these two big stars like in 2021 if this movie was made like maybe we'd be like oh my god like Mm -hmm. viola davis and jennifer lopez what Mm -hmm. (laughs) but at that time like maybe it's just like oh hmm, that's interesting I would never put them two together. Like, <laughs> yeah. then that's that's an interesting point. And but like true J Lo and Viola fans and fans of this show would know that this is actually the second time Jennifer Lopez and Viola Davis got to work together. Yeah. The first being one of our all time favorites that we keep going back to, Steven Sodenberg's Out of Sight. Yes, um, Viola Davis plays. Um, oh man, I forget his name oh isaiah washington Mm -hmm. um his character's like i think sister or something like Mm -hmm. when jennifer lopez's character goes to try to get information and she beats that one guy up Mm because he's like being hella misogynistic putting the words on her yeah she's viola davis is in that room Mm -hmm. missing and they said they had a good time recording or not recording. <laughs> We're recording. <laughs> I had a good time filming even back then. Um, anyways, I'm curious what post life Lil Raj and <laughs> someone on his website had to say about this movie. In a posthumous little Raj world, um, this is the second review I'm reading from writer Peter Subchinsky. I think Parker was a female writer. Or maybe Boy Next Door was a female. No, Boy Next Door is a female writer. I think Parker was Peter Subchinsky um, because the writing of it seems really familiar. But this uh, reader gives Lila and Eve one star. Damn. Yeah, I know. Um, he. <laughs> I was kind of holding my breath to you. Was. <laughs> I know I was really surprised too, and I know we'll, we'll we have a bit to discuss just about overall how we like this movie. But Peter Subchinsky says, "Lila and Eve" is the latest in a long line of films about ordinary people whose loved ones who lo- who lose loved ones to horrible acts of violence and who take the law into their own hands when the justice system fails them. A subgenre broad enough to include in the likes of Death Wish and In the Bedroom. Those two films in particular took the premise seriously and thoughtfully and elevated them above such ugly and space crypto fascist revenge porn fantasies. Lila and Eve doesn't hesitate for a moment before heading down the latter path thanks to a screenplay by newcomer Pat Gilfillan that constantly seesaws between the stupid and the sickening as our heroines stalk and dispose of their play- prey with startling ease. <laughs> the moves have been depicted by director Charles Stone III in the most passionless manner imaginable. Even though this was always intended to be a theatrical release, his approach to the material is as blandly formulaic as the weakest offerings on the tube. Instead of rage and emotional confusion, this material should inspire in viewers. They will mostly be veering between bad laughs and utter boredom. Damn. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wow, he really took he really took this review there. And this is one that like every now and again I'll read through, even if I disagree with the rating, I might find something that I can generally agree with about their rating. Like if they say something like to explain their reasoning and their writing, but I personally can't find anything that I really agree much with this reviewer. Yeah, um, I can't. And you know what's funny is that I miss a little Raj, but I'm realizing how good he was at his job. Like there's a reason why like yeah. Uber and Roper were like the shiznit. Like even for our unfinished life, promo for the the tv spot is like one of the quotes of like eber and roper give this one Mm -hmm. you know and the way he wrote reviews was like he could be harsh about a movie or be like you know this wasn't that great there's been better things but like he wasn't like disrespectful or rude about it yeah this review is just like 
unnecessary mean words. Like, Agreed. Agreed. And he goes on to say a little bit more specifically about Viola Davis and Jennifer Lopez in particular. He says, despite the film being simply awful through and through, the usually excellent Viola Davis does her damnedest to make something of her character. And while not even her undeniable gifts make anything of it, it's oddly inspiring to see her at least making the effort. Lopez, on the other hand, coasts through in a particularly lack, lack, I can't read this word. Lackluster? No, it's lackadaisical. Yeah, lackadaisical. (laughs) Learn me something, particularly lackadaisical manner that only partially explained by later revelations about her character. Students of film history will note that this is the second time Davis and Lopez have appeared together in a movie, hence out of sight. Needless to say, if you only see one Davis Lopez joint this weekend, make it that one and let Lila and Eve on its way to a permanent birth as a classic cable staple. Or sorry, basic cable staple. Okay, well, that part I can agree with, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. Out of sight is the better of the two. For sure, but you didn't have to be... (laughs) I wouldn't call this movie basic cable either. I mean, sure, it's produced by Lifetime Films, and it does kind of read like a Lifetime, but to me, there's more there than just, like, a basic cable movie. Well... I mean, since we disagree, I think this is a great time to, you know, shit all over Peter's words and <laughs> give our own opinions and not even give him more airtime on our fucking podcast. So. I agree. I agree, Bria. So, Simone, what did you think about Lila and Eve? How many pumps and butter would you give this movie? I would give this... A good solid two and a half. It wouldn't be a full three only because I felt like there could have been more suspense. Um, And with a budget of 4.9 mil or a cool five, you know, it was definitely spent a lot on that ending explosion for sure. Not really. Because that was some mm, CGI. (laughs) Yeah. Or maybe it was spent on Davis and Lopez. Who knows? But even though they like co-produced the film. But I... um, I felt like there was enough there that it could have been a little bit more suspenseful and it is predictable. You know what? I I don't think it's predictable, but I agree with your two and a half. And I think I agreed with Peter about Viola until he started shitting on our girl Jennifer Lopez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think she was passive in this role at all. I think it was just like an underdeveloped character. Yes. Which, again, we have said many times, you know, an actor can only do so much with Mm -hmm. what is written on the page. So I think this probably suffers from the script more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, you know, that... Man, I just... His review is just, like, rubbing me I know, there's something, like... There's that so doesn't much quite taste about right. this movie that I want to talk about that, like, it has so much potential, you know? And mm-hmm. I just don't think that it, like, I think it could have been fine as an indie movie. Like, it doesn't need a huge budget, but mm-hmm. I do think it needed some soul in mm-hmm. it. And um, we'll talk about that. But you yeah, have mm-hmm. two and a half pumps for me. Okay. Um, do you want to do cocktails and snacks now or you know i'll be a straight up honest with this one i can think of a of a well because like yeah they made dinner maybe once um or like they went out to lunch or they, they had spaghetti ha- they had spaghetti but yeah or oh, no no it would be lemon squares my snack would be lemon squares because there was a mother in the grief counseling that kept talking about lemon bars and lemon squares I don't How she was that. like famous for making them. She like brought it up every scene she was in. Um, so lemon squares would be my snack, but then my cocktail, maybe just a stiff glass of red wine. Yeah, sometimes that poured a nice glass of red wine. And yeah, that was good. I'm gonna say the spaghetti. Okay, it looked Mom's very spaghetti. generic, but. <laughs> Mom spaghetti never go wrong, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or church spaghetti. Church spaghetti is like 
magical. Ooh, side note, what's magical about church spaghetti? <laughs> some some old lady made it probably. <laughs> oh. No, church spaghetti is not really that great. It's like really greasy, and <laughs> <laughs> but it does have like a very unique uh, feel with it, especially with a bagged side salad with some ranch, like, mm. and some cold chicken wings. Like, or, <laughs> I know you're a vegetarian, but like, it's <laughs> see the plate that I'm describing. Black people will know, like, it's giving very much like repass after a funeral. It's giving very much like after you know some kind of praise dance, uh, mm-hmm. special worship or something. Like okay, that. we've just I've just never seen spaghetti at like at a temple function before unless it was someone's bar mitzvah and they were having it catered at like another restaurant but that's super rare just yeah. never seen spaghetti yeah church spaghetti too is like it's usually like uh meat sauce mm-hmm. not very saucy that's why i said it, it's pretty greasy like mm. there's some little nibs of whatever beef turkey mm-hmm. ground turkey um and it has a faint hint of tomato because there's not much sauce. Um, Got it. <laughs> it's usually the noodles are really short, like and chopped okay. up. You know, gotta make it stretch. <laughs> you know, go get the most noodles <laughs> you can out of it because um, you're cooking for a lot of a lot of church folk. Okay. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> um, Is it served in a crock pot or like a like a big cast iron Tupperware? N- nothing nothing that nice it's served oh. in probably a disposable um aluminum <laughs> pan that... uh okay better that's better that's better yeah, yeah. <laughs> that at the that end of the night the someone's like charlene you want to take the rest of the spaghetti like okay i'm gonna throw you some chicken wings on the other side and you want some of this out like <laughs> okay <laughs> some okay. of these rolls too i'll put some like yeah no one's bringing nice dishes anywhere <laughs> I never noticed that about black people. Yeah, you never really bring anything. Like, if you're bringing something to a function, you're not putting it in, like, your nice tableware or, like, dish. Hmm. You're bringing that shit in something that, you like, you keep that and throw it away or whatever. Like, I'm out. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> um, anyways. Today maybe, I learned. Maybe we'll s- stick church spaghetti at the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, anyways, let's talk about, let's talk about the trailer. I feel like it's your standard run-of-the-mill trailer. Uh, yeah. kind of gave away some stuff, but, um. It did, but not the major, like, big twist of the no. movie. Yeah, no, it did not. But, but I could definitely feel, like, the way I described this movie to Leah, my sister, when she asked, was just like, this is like a ride-or-die film but like a lifetime version of just mom seeking revenge. And I, I, that's like the vibes that I felt watching this was like yeah. two women supporting each other through their grief and possibly getting themselves into trouble and like what happens next kind of thing. Yeah, which was not what I was expecting from this movie. I don't know why I thought this was a heist movie. <laughs> It would have been cool if it was. Yeah, like, I no clear. I think it's that other movie Viola Davis was in that's mm. a heist movie that I was like, is this that one? But it's not. Mm. But, yeah, I was like, oh, shit. I was not expecting that this is what this was about. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so besides the trailer, um, is this a movie that you would have tried to see in theaters or maybe been like, hmm? Maybe a rental or a red box night. Like, like, sadly, no. I don't think this would be something I would see in the theater. But like, if my if I was living at home and my parents had rented it from like Red Box, and maybe I'd sit down and give it a shot. Because I do. You're not even renting it. Parents is renting. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Because I do. <laughs> Of course, thanks to this podcast, Jennifer Lopez is now very much on my radar and we follow her and we will follow her blindly forever. But Viola Davis was someone who's always kind of on my radar. Um, And I so like if they had advertised it like, oh, it's a Viola Davis movie, I'd be like, oh, okay, like I might sit down and watch it for that. 
Yeah, uh, this would have been neither. This probably would have been a movie maybe my mom was watching, and I'd be like, what, what's this? And then, like, maybe I'll sit down for a few minutes and be like, hmm, that's kind of cheesy. Yeah. <laughs> and then leave. <laughs> Um, but I mean, having watched the movie, like if I saw this on TV, I'd probably watch it. Like yeah. having already watched it, I'd be like, oh, why would he use on? Like, mm-hmm. I'll watch it. Um, is there anything from interviews that we want to talk about? I don't know. I just thought that they asked kind of the same generic questions. What was it like working with so-and-so and, you know, yeah. what drew you to this film? I think their chemistry between the two of them between viola davis and j-lo kind of show enough that it looks like they had a really good time making this movie and the times where they weren't out for vengeance and it was like just the two of them it just felt like a real natural friendship that maybe the two of them had like the way that their dialogue came across to me wasn't so much like acting it just sounded more of just like some conversation that two friends would have yeah so and I, I could kind of get that sense from the uh, from the interviews as well. Yeah, um, from the interviews, what I got um, was Viola Davis talked, or someone asked her what makes this movie and role different, and she's like me. <laughs> but <laughs> I was like a plus. But um, the I think I don't know. I forget who it was. It's not the director. Is it the writer? Yeah, the writer, Pat Gillifillan. I hope I said that right. Mm -hmm. um, Said that, you know, it's important to see big names like these two in a movie in roles like this. And um, I think, too, a big part of getting them in this movie was to try to draw people into the movie because you have Viola Davis and Jennifer Lopez. Mm -hmm. But, like, I never saw anything advertising this movie or something. Like like I said, in 2021, if they were in a movie together, I'd be like, oh, shit. Like, that looks interesting. Um, 2015, again, Jennifer Lopez wasn't on my radar. I think Viola Davis probably was because she was, like, on the up and up. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't on my radar at all. So I feel like they fumbled that they had a mm-hmm. good intention in ter- terms of getting two amazing big names, but didn't really do what they thought it would do. Mm-hmm. Um, I did think it was interesting that Viola Davis talked about like how it's kind of it's kind of different a revenge story of a woman compared mm-hmm. to like a man. Like mm-hmm. think of something like Taken with Liam Neeson. Yeah. And this and like there's a different layer to this because she's a woman like yeah not so much just like anger and testosterone and like i gotta avenge my family like yeah um and the twist in the movie i think is that extra layer that um that that is kind of indicative of like a mother's experience of having yeah grieve and maybe seek justice and vengeance um so i thought that was interesting also like i feel like they don't make a lot of revenge movies with women so and i feel like we're good at revenge so (laughs) they should work on that genre a lot more methodical i think well okay and this kind of goes back to the writer or the reviewer um peter sapchinski but like in such a male dominated lens men don't go to see those movies and then but men are typically the ones who are writing about and reviewing about those movies and so that's when he brings up that term of like revenge porn because it's this like someone who's dead set out on a quest to get vengeance for whatever wrongdoing it was and you're right that is more of a male dominated role but like god forbid when a woman does it if they're seeking revenge on a man for a wrongdoing um then it's like ooh, hold hold on to your penis boy she's out for blood <laughs> like everyone gets <laughs> so up in a tizzy about it and it's yeah. like I feel like, unfortunately, I I think as women, we appreciate those movies. I think, unfortunately, revenge movies 
whether it's from a female or male perspective, have different standards to them, and that is fucked up. You know what's funny, though, is that, like, male revenge movies are never, like, I don't think I can think of one. There probably is one, but I can't think of one that is, like, a man getting revenge on a woman, like, doing something to him. Well, that's just, like, calling, that's just serial killer shit. (laughs) <laughs> that's like a woman women rejecting don't even a man have to do anything i know so. i know but in a in a sociopath's mind that's revenge yeah you know or the boy next door would you consider that a male revenge movie because he rejected her advance well sorry he wanted to progress their relationship she said no it was a mistake he kind of sets on revenge what do you think about that see this is the problem is that like the things men get upset about are not as drastic as the shit women get upset about. Right. Like, being upset about not sleeping with someone versus being upset about the murder of your child are two yes. very different things. Like, I'm saying, like, pound for pound, let's switch this to being two dudes whose kid got killed and some women killed their child. And they were like, we gonna kill these bitches. Like, <laughs> There's no movies like that. Like, mm. oh, okay, I see that. Yeah, like, and I don't know that I necessarily want to see it, but I'm just saying, like <laughs> that that weird, like that double standard, like the things that, like the things that a girl would kick somebody in the balls for, versus what a boy would punch a girl in the tent for. It's totally different. Kind of totally like, different. A, a boy will punch you in the tent because. You're going he back wants and to forth. touch your titty. <laughs> you're going back and forth and you're like, well, your mom's a bitch. And like, it's like, we're fighting. What do you want me to say? Mm-hmm. But like, a girl would only stoop to those levels if she was being threatened in some kind of fearful way. And mm-hmm. like, there's nothing I feel like a woman, okay, not nothing, but there are very extremes where a woman just violently does something to a man. For no fucking reason. Right. Like, because we're afraid of them. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> unless, unless they're just, like, in an abusive-ass relationship and they know that they can punk that dude, then mm-hmm. it's not really just going to happen to some random dude. Mm-hmm. But anyways, I think this is a good point to summarize the movie, and I think you should do it. Okay. All right. Here we go. So, Lila and Eve. Viola Davis plays a character named Lila, a single mother in Atlanta whose world is shattered when her older son, Stefan, is killed when he gets caught in the crossfire of a drive-by shooting. Barely able to take care of herself, let alone her younger son, Justin, and with the police seemingly uninterested in getting to the bottom of what appears to be just another random shooting, Lila is at wit's end until she joins a support group for other mothers whose children have also been murdered. It is here where she meets the mysterious Eve, played by Jennifer Lopez, a fellow group member who sits off to the side without ever participating and stalks off whenever she feels like it without anyone noticing or seems less interested in moving on than in having her loss avenged by any means necessary. Naturally, Lila chooses her eve to be her sponsor and one night while engaging in some therapeutic home redecorating because after all folks this is a lifetime movie they find a gun in justin's book bag a discovery that horrifies lila but inspires eve to suggest that they go out to look for someone with information regards in regarding stefan's killing Will the two successfully revenge, seek revenge on the murders of their children? Is Eve all who she is chalked up to be? And why is she someone who has some kind of a mysterious cloud surrounding her? You will smoke. just... <laughs> and, oh, so much cigarette smoke. Just, sorry, thank you. And she is someone who is constantly surrounded by a shroud of mystery, a.k.a. cigarette smoke. (laughs) You are going to have to find out the twist yourself if you watch Lila and Eve or if you listen to the rest of this episode. Spoilers (laughs) ahead. Duh. Did you write that? 
No, I didn't. <laughs> I, that is someone else's writing. <laughs> I was like, that's really good. <laughs> All right. So at this point, let's talk about the cast and these lovely ladies. Mm-hmm. Um, my first note is about Viola Davis. And I was like, this isn't her wheelhouse. She does pain and like hurt yes, very she well. Does. Like, uh-huh. so I was like thrown off because I thought this was a fucking heist movie. <laughs> And and then I'm like, oh, shit, this seems serious. So <laughs> caught me off guard. But I was like, I'm not saying it's easy, but like, you know, her bag in this department is pretty deep and full. So agreed. Agreed. And then a fun fact, her husband plays the role of her like little love interest neighbor, dude. No way. Yes. That is As Ben Julius Tenen? Yes. Really? Oh, that's so interesting. And so they co-produced this Aww. movie together. But I thought I thought that was, I was like, damn, that's her husband in real life. Like what? Oh my gosh, um, how sweet. Yeah, and then I mean, it's really mostly Lila and Eve in this movie, but mm-hmm. I mean, I thought her son was pretty both her sons were pretty, like, you know interesting um mm-hmm. her younger son justin I, played by ron caldwell i thought kind of reminded me of like lebron's son <laughs> for some reason mm-hmm. um and then yolanda ross plays patrice um another mom in this grief group mm-hmm. and it's very interesting because she's on this show called the shy and mm-hmm. she's not in a grief group but there is a grief group on the shy so it's like wow this is it isn't far off from that and then you have michelle brianna white who i've Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure i've seen her in some other stuff yolanda ross her character patrice she was the one with the lemon bars and the lemon squares how did i miss that i don't know smh oh also andre royo who was in the wire Mm -hmm. you ever watch the wire so i couldn't I, I did not have a full Leo moment. I was just like, he looks familiar. But I it was like, I was not pressed enough to figure it out. But because yes. his detective character irritated my soul. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, but pretty they should have given those people less dialogue and more yes. like exposition for the other characters. Totally. It was, too, it was too like too much cop banter that it was like smacking you over the head. And it wasn't even, like, good cop banter, which yeah. is interesting because The Wire is such a good show mm-hmm. about, like, cop shit. So, like, I feel sorry that he had to say some of that stuff. <laughs> that was just, like, sh- shut the fuck up. Like, yes. <laughs> and it felt insensitive. And I think that was helpful because that's kind of the premise of the movie is that the cops aren't doing enough about yeah. her son's murder mm-hmm. and so some of their dialogue i was just like there are dead people there's a crime scene can you like be like have some fucking respect like yeah. these are people too like i know in movies we make them out to be like criminals or bound people that doesn't mean that they weren't like humans before that yeah well so so let's talk more so about Viola Davis now mm-hmm. since she is our main protagonist and a mm-hmm. heavy hitter in this movie. What do you think of her performance, unlike Mr. Peter? <laughs> little Pete. Um, little Pete. Little small Pete energy. <laughs> little Piccolo Pete. <sighs> Anyways, <laughs> sorry. I'm just, like, I'm just fired up today in general, but um, here we go. I thought, I mean... Viola Davis can, I think I've said this about a few other people, she can act her way out of a paper bag. She's just, (laughs) she can take a script, she can take a low budget film or something a little bit more indie and still like give it a shot and still come across as like top notch and put together. Um, Of course, there were parts about the story or about the movie, like if it was a little bit longer, could have been her character could have you know, been a little bit more polished and neat, but I think overall her her acting was great. Yeah. I mean I can't say much more than that, but like I I just wish that this character had a little more like that we could cut some of that cop shit and <laughs> explore right. her character more. Or even like like some of the 
Well, I don't want to say some of the stuff with her younger son, but I don't know. I just feel like for what emotionally she went through and okay, here's the cat out of the bag is that she is in such a depressive state that she pretty much imagines and makes up Eve. She makes up this persona of this person of revenge because in this grief support group, and I think they say the same line in like Alcoholics Anonymous, not from that I know from experience, but just because I know like (laughs) shows that I've watched that's had it of like, I, I accept the things I can't control and I will try, oh, hold on. What's the, I'm going to look it up. It's like, I know what you're trying to say, but I don't know the quote. Okay, yeah. Except the things I can change. Change, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And that's the whole premise behind um, this support counseling group that Eve, uh, or sorry, that Lila ends up going to. Um, But already knowing that like, not hate, well, yeah, hate is in her heart and revenge is on the back of her mind. Um, and so Eve stands for everything that's like truly what Lila is thinking and feeling, but still feels like she has to go through the grief counseling as like going through the motions of things. I don't know. Anyways, yes, cat's out of the bag on this one j-lo isn't real she's in her head <laughs> which like i was like oh me and oh me i was like oh my she's a fucking ghost <laughs> like that i was like <gasps> um gas dude i wish i kind of had a little badass guardian angel j-lo behind me smoking a cigarette <laughs> like if like you know if a kid if a student is pestering me and bothering me i could see j-lo being there in she's the back gonna get you like, fired i know okay. she's- <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna happen she'd be like you know what you should do <laughs> you should kick that kid in the balls <laughs> they're like take it take his son take his son yeah take son. it smash it smash it they're on the floor oops it flipped my bad (laughs) oh my god i mean that would be uh fun now this character of eve would be bad now the real jennifer lopez i feel like might be a little a little more motivational like oh no yeah she'd be like smell and pick your feet up (laughs) pick that piccolo peat up and fucking <laughs> smack him on the ground. Okay. She would say, Simone. <laughs> she say, Simone, pick your feet up, dust off your shoulder, refresh with some blockbuster hit cream, and move on with your life. Spritz a bit of JLo glow. Not you putting an ad in for JLo. <laughs> fake j-lo in your mind (laughs) um but i've seen a lot of very motivational kind of stuff on her j-lo beauty stuff so Uh um yeah i think i think she'd be like more encouraging but um on that note let's talk about her her role as eve um i was i was thoroughly surprised i was not expecting that yeah and the twist the or just like I her was, performance her well not necessarily her performance at this point like i think performance wise we're pretty like you know Jill's a good actress like she mm-hmm. hasn't really acted badly in a movie she's been in some bad movies but she hasn't acted poorly all right I agree. um whereas i can say like ben affleck acted poorly in Geely. like <laughs> it wasn't his best work <laughs> like <laughs> i'm just saying like all right you're getting gangster gangster on it his, Bria. All his right. performance was cringier than hers like it was. well because so. she's just so sexy anyways and, yeah but <laughs> but so um not so much the performance but like the character i wasn't expecting her to play 
that character and then um it kind of was like oh and again like it's a movie or a character that i wouldn't necessarily be like oh yeah i could see why she picked like her romantic comedies i'm always like yeah I, we know you love romantic comedy so it makes sense why you did this movie but like this movie i'm like it's interesting why she would choose to do this movie like so and i think her choosing to do a movie like this like she doesn't get enough credit in that regard in terms of her career because she wasn't even the first choice again for this fucking role (laughs) (laughs) like um fuck who was it i forget but i i watched uh who who was the first choice hmm I forget who who it was, but I watched an interview with the director, Charles Stone, and he was talking about Jennifer, and he himself was like, you know, I had never, like, I didn't even think about Jennifer Lopez for this role, like, just based on what she's done before and stuff, like, this isn't something I was like, you know, it would be good in this, like, and I was like, I could see that, I get it, she is, like, somebody you think of as like a romantic comedy person maybe Mm -hmm. sexy and then you know oh yeah she played the hell out of selena Mm -hmm. but um movies like a border town or unfinished life Mm -hmm. or um you know some of those smaller kind of indie movies you turn get forgotten about and those are the movies she's known for so of course like oh charlie charlie saren Yes. Was the first choice. Yes. Okay. Already committed to another movie, Dark Places, in 2015. Yes. I totally saw that and forgot it. But so, again, she kind of lucked into this role. And I think she really pursued this. He was like, you know, she read the script and she's very interested. And she had like a lot of stuff to say to kind of like make, like, share her thoughts. And they were good thoughts. And so, you know, it just wound up working out. So. Um, he said, quoted that they had a very spirited meeting that made her think twice. And, um, obviously her presence is a great marketing power. So that was, you know, another bonus of having someone of her name, even Charlie Saren probably would have been the same route versus like someone, nobody knows who Mm -hmm. they are. Um, but I thought like, I really liked that he was like, you know, we had a very spirited me- meeting, which means to me that it seems like J-Lo was very passionate about doing this and very interested in mm-hmm. telling this story, mm-hmm. which I think says more about her than most people would ever think to give her credit for. Mm-hmm. Because this is a movie about a black mom who lost her son to gun violence and is getting revenge. And who knew that Jenny from the block would want to do a movie like that hell yeah but yeah i liked her performance um i wasn't expecting it for from her and then i didn't realize that this was 2015 when i watched it so the fact that she played in the boy next door she's like uber fucking hot teacher yeah hot mom next door and then in this she's kind of a little she's bit... homely yeah I, I don't know if that's the right word to say she's just disheveled she's a bit um down on her luck smokes a pack of cigarettes like yeah her hair is uh, kind of ruffled or like shoved in a beanie poorly she... dyed <laughs> yeah god that wig um, <laughs> Re- reflected a, a bad dye job but then yeah would usually wear just like very casual like ask leisurely kind of clothes not even that that ugly fucking jacket she's like one yeah. of those people who only has like one jacket or like yeah. two but mm-hmm. and, and sorry if you're one of those people we're not all fortunate to have wardrobes like the real jennifer lopez but <laughs> like just in a characterization of the character like this type of woman Mm -hmm. that she's portraying and i was thoroughly impressed as i always am when anybody's able to make j-lo look kind of average (laughs) like yep yeah i think this is the best one so far agreed because i think in an unfinished life they tried to make her look just more like farmy and ranch and country like cutie yeah yeah but not so much like down on her luck like i mean obviously they did make up with like bruises and stuff um and maybe we might have seen a little bit of like grit or no makeup 
kind of looks in some of her earlier, like maybe nurses on the line. But again, she was like, she's a lot younger and she's looked like a little different. Face, like baby face J -Lo. Yes. And so there's something about this where I kind of looked really hard at the TV and was like, I know they never, like, they rarely ever just send actors and actresses without any makeup on because there's certain things that your skin picks up with your lighting and the camera mm -hmm. and your scene and stuff like that. But in some points, it truly looked like she wasn't wearing any makeup, which that's not to say that she's ugly because JLo hops on her Instagram all the time to do like a little skincare routine. And she is often like, fresh face no makeup and i'm like god damn it but there was just something about this that looked like oh i haven't washed my face in like three days like she just looked gritty <laughs> yes she did <laughs> <laughs> she looked a bit gritty and a little gracie mm -hmm. um <laughs> and she was mad a lot like she wasn't she was. very she was pissy. approachable you know so i think that added it added it <laughs> i think that added to it and I think too that um, she looked she looked worn, you know. She looked like mm. a mom who had been through some shit, like mm -hmm. whose kid went missing and nothing happened, and she's still fucking mad about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I liked it. Um, I liked her smoking. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, and then at some point, I don't know. Oh, at some point I spotted a Netflix envelope, but um, at some point I wrote that she's a bit unhinged. I like this. It's different. And mm -hmm. I think it was like when they shot the dude in the parking lot. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Like, they're like legit. And she just did that shit. And then yeah. she was like, I did it. And what? Like, come on, let's get this shit. And like, let's go figure some shit out. And yeah. Like, no, no time to freak out about it. Let's go. Yeah. Then that I was not prepared for. So, <laughs> um, oh, and then there's a part where they um, are trying to go to this club that they figure out that, you know, to try to get some more information. And so they dress up and get ready and they're taking selfies in the bathroom. And God, like, what I wouldn't give to be the little like <laughs> lipstick tube, just like watching them. <laughs> enjoy um but that scene i thought too was great in terms of how jayla looked because they could have easily glammed her up but she mm -hmm. looked very much like a mom going out on the weekend. yes yeah she did yeah and i mean like she looked great in the dress but she definitely looked like this is my one going outfit <laughs> going out outfit and Oh, and, and then throw on some nice ugly, blue eyeshadow. <laughs> ugly fingerless leather gloves that uh, <laughs> like it's like Lord. one accessory too far. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. Um and then I I really noticed too though that when they were taking the selfies that the bitch can't turn off that she knows her angles. Like, oh, she sure, yeah. Yeah, she was serving. She was. <laughs> even, yeah, even in acting, she was like, okay, I know I'm supposed to, like, act to take a selfie, but she's actually going to take these pictures, so I want to look <laughs> But, yeah, which later, as we know, J-Lo's character is not real, so later, that's another part of uh, Lila's revelation that yes. she kind of conjured up this person, is going back through those photos and no one else is there but her and i was like oh shit like she's in a psychosis like i don't know all these words that <laughs> probably like me trying to diagnose her have no clue um so should we talk a little bit more about like plot like what we liked what we didn't like what we thought could have been better or would have made this better yeah let's go for it i think better. overall for my my biggest issue was with this movie was how easy it was for the plot to happen it just yeah there were a lot of things that just happened really naturally that seemed like it would have taken a really long time to get to that point or so like for example lila and eve go out to find the first person who they think they can be in contact with um to find out more information about stefan shooting and then that conversation escalates and Lila takes the gun that was in Justin's book bag and shoots him although the movie makes it look like Eve shot him but yeah obviously we know it's Lila but 
he was dead and it was very easy for them to just like take his stuff and leave and flee the scene and then when they do it again at the like top of the roof parking lot Mm -hmm. they kill two people three and injure i think they injure the other person right i thought he was dead too the one that fell off the roof yeah oh shit he was dead to die okay so three people so now their total body counts four and then they kill that other person that they meet after that they kind of like stalk at the club and then also hurt his wife and so i don't know that just seems like it was very easy for them to get there do like commit the crime flee the scene and eventually the lead detective what was his character's name flanagan (laughs) (laughs) whatever the lead detective who was in charge of her son's case um detective Detective holliston holliston yeah shay wiggingham but yeah detective holliston who was in charge of her son's case is now also on the homicide department of these other cases does start to kind of put two and two together but again spoiler alert by the end of the movie he goes and meets her and finds lila at her grief counseling and starts the conversation of like hey i think you should come in downtown we're gonna ask you for like a few questions because he was kind of on to her and lila's mother support group steps in and goes oh but i was with her and I was, you know, I can, you know, vouch for her that she was with me and doing this and that. And the detective just goes an alibi full of or like a room full of grieving mothers. What an alibi. And then just like steps up and walks away. So it just I don't know what I would have liked if I would have wanted her to get away with it or. For her to have been found out and also discover her mental illness and her grief. Mm. Um, and then we see this like ending scene maybe where she's in a women's prison and she's saying that same thing of about I can accept the things I cannot change kind of yeah. thing. You know what I mean? I don't know. Just some kind of a little bit of a different wrap up. But Besides that, I didn't have too much issue about this movie. It just seemed easy for them to commit crimes and for them to get away with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, one one thing I noted, I was like, what is their plan? And I feel like that's <laughs> the big flaw, too, is that there's no, like, we're along for this ride with her and Eve and her imagination. But we don't have a sense of, like, what our purpose is for a while. It's like, what are they doing? Like, why? Mm-hmm. Um because at, at first I was like, are we trying to help find the the whoever took Eve's daughter? Or like, okay, wait, we're avenging Lila's son's murder. Okay. Yeah. And, and as Eve tr- is getting some kind of closure through it. Yeah. Yeah. And as a true crime person, I'm, of course, like, you could never just do that. Somebody would have saw your car. Somebody <laughs> would have saw y'all in the parking lot talking to him. Like, they, yeah. there were witnesses available, okay? It's just sloppy. Sloppy. Yeah. And I feel like, too, like you said, like, it happened too easy, and they just kind of hopped from, like, okay, now we know this person was involved. Now we know this person was involved. And I think they should have showed some of that research. Like, they should have showed them going through his phone and figuring shit out and p- piecing stuff together. Cause I think that's a big part of these type of movies. Yeah. It's like sleuthing piece. Yeah. It's like, Oh shit. Okay. Like that's how they figured that out. And essentially they did all of the work that her detectives should have done in like three days worth of time. Yes. So it would have been really great to have seen their process through that. Yes. You took the words literally out of my mouth. Because Sorry. I was going to say, <laughs> and like it just goes to show how little effort the police were putting in because mm-hmm. they were able to figure all this kind of stuff out. So, well, I don't want to say easily because the police can't just like take take his phone. But yeah, they need you know, a proper warrant. But they could have 
you know, at least figured out that he was somewhat connected to right. it and stuff right. like that. And like the other kid who got shot, like realized he was a fucking dealer and who he was dealing for and stuff. But mm-hmm. anyways, um, it's hard with those kinds of things because it's like those people are like the smaller fish and they usually want like the big distributor person mm. and they're like, uh, it's not really worth us going after like this one little corner dealer because there's just gonna be another one just like there was another one when they went to like scope stuff out there like there's already someone back here Uh dealing drugs like it never happened um so like those are my problems with the movie i don't think their performances were bad i just think they didn't have that much to work with Uh um and I think this would be a good candidate for a movie to be remade. And oh, for sure. Keep them and just give them some good material to work with. Some like mm-hmm. really deep gut wrenching stuff. Like if we saw more like glimpses of Lila's depression and mental illness, like we mm-hmm. saw like the pills and like stuff like that, but there wasn't like this kind of weird, like something's happening. And I think that yeah. would have really happened helped in a movie like this like i love movies like that like we're like yo what's happening like something's off yeah and then you get that twist of like eve being made up and you're like oh my god like i knew something was weird and there were those moments there they just weren't like i feel like they weren't well done or they weren't highlighted enough like they were like, very brushed up upon and yeah. someone could easily say oh well that's just the writing trying to be mysterious or to lead you on but by the time that that twist was revealed when uh, when Lila was going through her phone to show her boyfriend husband next door of mm-hmm. like, oh, this was me. Like, this is me and Eve when we were going out. But then it's just her and you're like, oh, shit. Like, yeah. but it, it just happened a little abruptly. So I agree that if they had lingered on her depressive state more and honing in maybe on the specific kinds of medication she was taking and i got the um i knew what the twist was when it was the part um at grief counseling where patrice yolanda ross's character was like oh my son's coming home like i'm gonna prepare the house because he's getting ready to come home and she relates it back to this like biblical verse and this explanation of jesus rising and coming back and viola looks over at the gal who runs the grief support counseling she's like yeah she get like it's the anniversary of her son's death like we all get like this sometimes and we just know to like really support one another and i was like Oh, that's her problem. Like she crazy too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it until um they were like, Oh, is are you calling like when they went to dinner? Oh and yeah. And they're like, like Oh, I you... don't know Eve. Like, is she the new gal? Yeah, and she's like, No, she's from and then she like pauses and then I was like, Oh, she she's not real. And then like the because in the beginning, when she's at the meeting and Eve's like off to the side and mm-hmm. kind of huffy, and then she leaves and then they go outside, it was weird to me that Lila was talking to her after her just like bouncing. Like, I thought she would have left, left, you know? Yeah. And then also, Lila wasn't very, she wasn't sharing a lot in that group, which understandable is like her first one, I think. Yeah. But um, it was weird to me that she would go outside and immediately like open up to a huffy stranger that just left. The group yeah, to have for- a little bit more build up of their relationship. Like if she goes back to the second one and she sees Eve and like yeah. Eve is sitting outside and she's like, hey, how come you don't say much? Blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. they, it happens a little bit more naturally because you're right. It seemed like she gives out a lot of information and then she's like oh hey like i'm supposed to have a sponsor why don't you be my sponsor it's like happens very quickly yeah there could have been like more build up or like mysteriousness there where it's like who's this lady that i keep like seeing but you know she doesn't talk or she's not like within the circle like 
Um, but yeah, like those things are things that are beyond actors' control. So um, I do want to point out that um, I was really after I watched the interview with Charles Stone the Third, I was really like, was kind of like impressed and was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, Daddy, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he has a very interesting resume and story as well and i just want to say peter i don't think his directing was that bad okay there's nothing about his directing that i was like oh this is shitty like these are some (laughs) shitty ass choices um um just a few fun facts he directed and created the what's up budweiser commercial no fucking way yes that was like a short film (laughs) what that was a short film that he did, like, because, also, fun facts, he was, a, like, he was doing music videos, and he wanted to do movies, so he was like, you know, I should make something so that, you know, yeah. when I'm in these rooms and stuff, like, oh, I made this, so the Was Up commercial came from a short film he made, but, um... He directed videos for The Roots, for Tribe Called Quest. He directed the Benita Applebaum movie. Um, He directed some other, to me, black classic movies like Paid in Full and Drumline. He did the TLC movie on MTV. Like, he's not a a director to just blink at and be like, "Mm, okay, it was all right. Like, the TLC movie is a good little TV biopic, in my opinion. Yeah. What else was I saying? <laughs> Why did I bring him up? I don't know. I just wanted to. Oh, it's him. like the interview. You were saying the interview after you watched it, you were really impressed. Yeah, but I forget what else. I think I just wanted to bring that up. Oh, okay. But, um, <laughs> I do want to say that I, it, I also wish. Okay, so the ending. There's like this whole scene where, obviously, she's killed some people. So, mm-hmm. pe- some people are after her, mm-hmm. and so. Oh, yeah. She kind of does this like genius home alone type thing (laughs) where she's able to watch these dudes break into her house Mm -hmm. and she's already prepared to like pretty much commit arson to kill them. (laughs) And I, I think like if there were more moments of that, of the other killings, like if she's really methodical about it and like planned shit. Like, this came out of nowhere for me. Because I was like, she was just gunning people down left and right. Like, and now all of a sudden, like, she has a plan. And she, like, set up some shit so that her house, like, catches on fire conveniently from the outside. Like, that's some boss ass shit. But, like, it just was like, where'd this come from? Like, Yeah. And as a true crime fan... I was just like, there's no way no one would be like, okay, but how conveniently your house catch on fire and there were three dudes in there looking for you. That's just, that's suspicious. Well, I think she knew that they were going to come to their ho- to her house at some point, right? So she like, that's why she booby traps it and well, knows. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying like, as if I was a detective, I'd be like, okay, what's, oh, what's God. the yeah, coincidence? Oh, God, yeah, from that true crime. That, yeah. Yeah, well, like that's three kind goons. Of... Come that's to your house. the reason why that lead detective is kind of like we need to have a chat yeah um and like then he was suspicious of her before that but that he was that yes over the edge i guess totally. like i can't overlook this like absolutely but he did it's a bad detective <laughs> bad detective and he just was like all right i guess i'll believe you and these room full of grieving mothers and girl got away with murder and it's bad too because like the whole time he's just like no i know that this isn't like what what you're like the other detective was saying like i know that this is something else this isn't just gang drug related stuff yeah there's someone doing this and he is just uh, is suspicious of her but like to just drop it is just like you could have been dropped this shit and she could have been got away with this like but you yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. I wasn't mad, though, at the moms at the end. Like, that could have been really cheesy and corny, but mm-hmm. I think they did it in a really well-done way that I was just like, that's right. Get the fuck out of our group, grief group. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not mad about them sticking up for her 
because again, this is like women support women. It's a true ride or die, like a lady ride or die film. But um, just the convenience for that cop to be like, okay, and like walk away. Because part of me, Bria, part of me, Bria, thinks that he left that day still knowing what his hunch was and still being like, I still think she did it, but like, I'm just going to drop it at this oh, point. Oh, yeah, he knew she did it. It wasn't even really a matter of, like, trying to get her to confess or something. It was like, I know you did this shit, and you're coming with me, and, you know, like. Mm -hmm. But I I kind of, now that you said that, you think it could have been more interesting if it ended, like, with her in prison and, you know, reflecting on her depression and grief and mental illness and stuff. I agree, because I feel like we don't see that enough. You know, mm -hmm. and how these things impact the people left behind. And that would have been an interesting narrative to tell, too, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I'm picturing, like, Orange is the New Black. Like, when they have those really good episodes of when you see why the women <sighs> when, get there. Yes! Oh, my God! The background stories for all of those women and how it was, like, so justified. Yeah. <sighs> Again, swift kick to the dick. <laughs> yes, I'm looking the other way. So yeah, like I, I think that because like if you say it ending like that, then there's a there can be a sense of like it's not obviously it's not a happy ending where she gets to move with her son and start over and you know try to leave some stuff behind. But at the same time, like I feel like it's a fulfilling ending, you know, in a way that. Yeah, it's not great that she's in jail, but at the same time, she's dealing with the stuff instead of, like, brushing it under the rug and stuff. Because it's not like we saw her, like, be like, you know what? I need to go to therapy or something like that. Like, she's just like, we need to move. We don't have a house, and we're out of here. And yep. and we yep. have this nice new VW, and, <laughs> and like, <laughs> girlfriend put her makeup on, and... um was out of there and it's just like that's like almost too perfect you know yeah and that's not how life works i don't know it wasn't yeah. a bad i don't think it's a terrible ending like it's better than angel eyes but <laughs> oh my god the freeze frame i can't <laughs> but like yeah i think i like your ending better like it just i feel like it adds more soul to the movie in some way yeah. Well, thanks. I don't know. You're welcome. <laughs> Any over, let's see if, yes, I think you had brought up that if this movie was remade today, like, would you go see it? Yeah. I wouldn't change much about the cast, honestly. I still would see this movie if it starred 2021 Viola Davis and Jennifer Lopez. Yeah, same. I think with the clout that both of them have, I don't know if they would pick up a role like this again. Maybe Jen maybe Jennifer Lopez will. I don't know what Viola Davis would do if she's a little bit more like choosy and picky with her roles. Not to say that Jennifer Lopez can't be choosy yeah. and picky because she is, but I don't know. I don't know if them now would do a film like this, but I would still definitely see it. I don't know, because I did kind of skim Viola's IMDb, because she's on my roll call list. Mm -hmm. um, and lately, she's definitely, like, in those serious, dramatic, like, award-chasing roles, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, in Jennifer Lopez, as we have come to discover, has, like, I don't want to say peaks and valleys, but she has, like, these these main streets and alleyways mm -hmm. and her main street is all about the romantic comedy like mm -hmm. that is her bread and butter i'm gonna get these couple millions off this movie and maybe it'll do a good baby and it won't but there's a big budget there so i'm mm -hmm. gonna get some i'm gonna get some bread let's get this bread and then there's some alleyways of like i want to do a really interesting movie that might not just get made by a big studio a la a boy next door a la this movie mm -hmm. and it's small budget but it's interesting and i can 
kind of stretch a little bit, something I haven't done, but it's not going to be like something that, you know, I'm going on. Like she didn't do any promo really for this movie besides the ET interview with her and Viola. But, um, but yeah, like the small little indie passion projects that occasionally she has. And it's like, I don't know what fuels that. Maybe just a desire to do that kind of stuff. But, um, but I think Viola Davis is very much like, I have arrived. I'm this extraordinary actress. People know I am. And I'm going to play the fuck out of all these roles that are amazing. Yeah. And I don't think J-Lo gets those opportunities. And I wish she did. But... Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, people treated her in the same way. I have a theory. <laughs> and I, yes. cause I was thinking about this. Because... Um, because I'm excited about her future movies, but she has two rom-coms coming and she has The Mother, which seems like this really interesting, like, action, maybe thriller movie. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I was like, after, what was it? I was just thinking and I was like, after this movie, she should have went dramatic. Like, she should have stayed in that lane. Because I think mm -hmm. she's she's pretty good there. And I think if she stayed in that lane, she could have really gotten even better. Mm -hmm. But I think, like, again, the commercial success of things like The Wedding Planner and Made in Manhattan. Like, it's, it's like, a, it's a choice I feel like some actors have to make. Mm -hmm. Like, do I want the nice big commercial career? Or do I want to, like, do some shit? that's like interesting could be commercially great because it's just like really really good acting because people mm -hmm. love that shit too they love oscar movies and stuff sure do and i think the big thing my big theory with jennifer lopez is that she has too much dip on her chip when it comes to acting mm -hmm. because she's a whole pop star like she's a whole package when she like think about it after out of sight is like when people are like, oh shit, she can act. Like, mm -hmm. she's in, this is impressive. She went commercial and she got an album deal or got mm -hmm. a record deal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like to be a serious dramatic actor, like you have to have time to do that. And I think that maybe memorizing a romantic comedy script's a little easier than having to deep dive and get into like this really meaty role for something and to like study and learn an accent and yeah. do it convincingly because i know we've talked about her accent before or change your appearance Ch yeah not necessarily yeah like body manipulation but yeah changing her appearance whether it's like hair putting on weight or losing weight or doing something dramatic with her hair or doing something like charlie theron did and monster like just like yeah. really uglying her up I don't know if I could see her doing but that. You can't but I do wish that if you're a pop star too. You, exactly. You can't do that when you're a pop star, when you're doing American Idol, when you're like doing these like cover photo shoots, when you have, you know, clothing and skincare lines that you're also modeling for. I totally agree with you there. So that's my theory as to why JLo didn't necessarily go that route with acting. Hmm. And that's why I think she's like pretty just consistent and do you think that there's sorry go ahead no, go ahead do you think there's something in her contract as a singer and performer that had like things that stopped her from maybe taking on certain roles like she could only do certain kinds of movies and like x amount of movies a year uh i don't know i doubt it like because i feel like part of the appeal of like I've said this in the music ones, and this whole rant might get cut, but, like, I've said this, that, like, people say, like, oh, well, she's an industry plant. Mm -hmm. Yes, she is, because she's a viable movie star. Like, people saw the potential in her from Selena. Like, they're like, mm -hmm. okay, we could get some decent songs for her. She's already a dancer. She's pretty. Like, there's not much more we need to do here. And so... I feel like it's not a liability in terms of having her act with the music part. 
Mm -hmm. I do think that for her image, she might have been conscious of the movies she chose to do in terms of how it played with acting and music. Because you can't you can't do something like Charlie Theron in Monster and and then be like, cause I'm real. <laughs> like you can't do that. Like maybe so you could, true. but like that would have been a hard that's sell. That's a lot to balance and juggle. Yeah, that's 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 kind of a hard sell. And like think about too, like other actors who, or like not actors, but like we talked about, like how so many black rappers singers have ventured into acting and have been pretty successful. But my big caveat is the music suffers for them. Like, Will Smith hasn't made a rap album in how long? Like, and it's not that he was a bad rapper. He was, like, a very specific kind of rap and very commercial, very kind of friendly, fun rap. But It was like, family. It was family friendly. Yeah. But, I mean, like, everyone loves the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air of course. song. Of course. I love his album, Big Bully Style. But in... When he came back with that switch song, that was everywhere when I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, he also has to be like he's not the type of not that not that those rappers can't be successful actors, but he's not also not the type of rapper who is like fuck these bitches, I'm gonna kill these like you know. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. And like even though those rappers can be successful in acting they also usually typically start out playing similar to their rap persona you mm, know mm-hmm. like a dmx he's like the tough guy in the action movies like you know with jet lee mm-hmm. he's not some teddy bear like dad single father with like three daughters <laughs> like a daddy's girl type movie or something you know he's like you know leave, he's- leave that to ice cube and like are we there yet right like that whole family series but even that took a while for it ice took cube. a while you have right. to do You're friday right. and he has to do barbershop he evolved. he evolved and he wasn't rapping like he was by the time he did that true true like he still His makes albums and stuff changed. Yeah, he still makes albums and stuff, but it's not like at it's not popular at the forefront like it was when he was in NWA NWA and when he left NWA. Like it took a while like for his rap career or his acting to her career and persona to surpass his rap career where like for like I don't even know Ice Cube dropped an album. Mm-hmm. I know he dropped a movie though. Mm-hmm. So same with like Queen Latifah. Mm-hmm. She sings, but I mean, in that too, she switched from rapping to singing mostly. Not that she can't hit them lyrics still, but I mean, as an actress, it's more, it's kind of more viable if I sing, a, make a jazz album than if I make a rap album, right? Right, because that jazz album is going to match the jazz album that goes with um, Chicago. Chicago and oh, Bess- I know what you're Bessie about. Smith. Yes, yes. But that's my long-winded speech <laughs> about actors slash uh, musicians. But it's a fine line to to walk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm gonna stop ranting about this. But All right, it's well, just like a revolution. Like the word was spoken to me, and I just had to get it out. It's like i'm glad you did and i don't think because honestly we're doing fine timing wise we're less than we're under two hours still so i like how that's impressive (laughs) well yeah for our other stuff but i know like you know we're trying to get a little bit more in sync or succinct or extinct or (laughs) piccolo pete whatever we want to say so on that note bria do we uh should we want to wrap up I think so. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, I think we hit it. We changed what we wanted to change. We 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 aired out our grievances, but we yes. both agree that like this film wasn't bad. It just could use some TLC. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. And to the people who stuck with us so far, please come back for another episode of the Great Value version of Inside the After Studio. That's right. And seriously, though, if you do like us enough to stick around, take another deep dive down this IMDb rabbit hole with us as we watch another animated movie next week, Home with Bad Girl Riri. 
that's gonna be interesting <laughs> i'm excited and on that note if you've got nothing better to do go figure out a theme to watch a bunch of movies you've never seen i'm your host simone and please subscribe to this blessed mess and leave us a like if you are into it not if you're into this in into it leave us a fucking like okay god yeah damn it. just please leave us a like it really helps we don't we want to quit our daytime jobs <laughs> I wish. I wish. Yeah. Especially since I'm like back now. <laughs> the struggle is real, okay? Gosh. I have podcast stickers all over anything I can at work. Not really, but close enough. <laughs> I want it to feel like summer break every day. <laughs> right? Oh, man. All right. Anyways, I'm your host, Bria. And it would be awesome for you to wipe off those buttery popcorn fingers and give us a review so I can get a notification while I'm at my day job and I can get a little joy and serotonin inserted into my life under Straight these head. fluorescent lights. Um, and if you'd like, also follow us at Roll Call Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and my favorite Twitter so I can also get notifications while I'm at work. <laughs> just kidding. If anybody at work listens to this, I'm just kidding. Um, I only answer that stuff on my breaks. And this has been another episode of Roll Call and Cut. <laughs>